All right, so uh, we also have Eric Dumazet, who's remote. He's going to participate in this. I'll let this start. Let's get started, I think. Hello. Yep. Hello. Welcome to this presentation about multipass TCP. And here we will mainly talk about how hard it can be to add multipass TCP to the upstream kernel. So we are here with uh, Matt Martino from Intel, I'm Mathieu Bath from Tessares, but we also have uh, Christoph Bach from Intel and uh, Peter Christat from, uh, from Apple, sorry, and, Chris and Peter Christat from Intel. They are both in the audience. Um, of course, please feel free to interrupt us, uh, especially if you have crazy ideas about how to solve the challenges that we will present. And, uh, yeah, if you are disturbing because we are both Matthew here, don't hesitate to just ask questions to Christoph over there. It will maybe be easier. Okay, so we will start with an introduction of multipass TCP. But uh, this time we will not go into deeply into details about uh, this protocol. First, because the protocol is what it is. We cannot change it. And secondly, because it's not the first time that we are presenting multipass TCP and NetDef, not us in particular. But what we will do is just to present a few bits to understand the challenge that we are facing. So our goal here is to explain why multipass TCP is super cool, uh, so why we need it upstream, but also to get some feedback to start discussion about the design, what we have started, and what we will do later. So about multipass TCP, in one sentence, it allows to exchange data for a signal connection over a different path, and it can be simultaneously. So we are breaking the assumption that one connection is linked to five tuple. So thanks to that, we can have more redundancy, we can have more bandwidth, we can support some uh, handover or mobility use cases. It's not a new protocol because uh, there is an RFC about that, there is also a working group at the IATF, and so it's not new in the Linux world, because the first implementation started in March 2009. Uh, there were many versions before that. Uh, we also support um, most of the latest LTS kernel, and we are still supporting the latest one. Um, also, it's not new uh, in production, because uh, MPTP is already enabled on millions of devices, and there are different use cases that we will present just after this. So speaking about use cases, we have the first one. It's the classical one. It's about the, the smartphone use case. And more specifically, about the walkout scenario. Uh, it's mainly f kind of famous with multipass TCP, with uh, voice streaming application and virtual assistance. So we have, for example, Siri in iOS that started with that. But uh, it's important to note that uh, multipass TCP was also in some Samsung and LG Android phone, but only in some countries like South Korea. So if we come back to the use case with Siri, uh, you can imagine that you have your smartphone, you're at, you at home or at your hotel. And what you are connected to the Wi-Fi, and you want to get some very important information, like where you can find the best poutine in Montreal. So you are doing that. You are getting out. And what happened? Of course, you are going to be slowly disconnected from the Wi-Fi. But as you all know, it's difficult to know when you are really disconnected, especially for the server side. So when you are in this situation, without multipass TCP, you will need to have a new connection to retransmit the data, maybe. And that's the only solution. That can be costly and then can be frustrating, especially for the user. But don't forget also about Siri, because they got the answer, but they were not able to provide this answer to the, to the user. Very frustrating. So thanks to multipass TCP, you can have uh, two connections. It's one multipass TCP connection, but you will have two TCP connections under that. One over the Wi-Fi, one over the cellular network. And thanks to that, if you are getting disconnected with the same scenario, then that's not an issue, because you can directly have packet going over the cellular network. So if you lost the Wi-Fi, that's fine. It's really um, transparent for the user. 
Another use case that, I, that we would like to present here is the one about hybrid access network. So it has been discussed at the broadband forum. There is a technical de document, the technical report document about that, uh, and it's supported by Tessares, Swisscom, and OVH companies, for example. Uh, so what they saw is that um, the telco operator, they have some clients that are very far from the DSL street cabinet. And it's very difficult and <coughs> it's also very, very costly for them for these few people to get a better internet connection. Uh, one solution for that, because many telco operators, they already own both the cellular and the uh, fixed network, they could combine, in fact, the two networks to get better bandwidth. Um, so to do that, it's kind of simple, but trust me, it's not for the software operators, uh, for the software company, but um, you can have a TCP to MPTCP proxy. You can uh, put it in the DSL CP, and then you have the TCP connection coming from the smartphone, the laptop, etc. They go to the router. The router is doing a proxy to be able to use both the fixed and mobile network and use the available capacity of the cellular network, for example. Uh, of course, you will need the end server to support multipass TCP, so it's easier to put uh, end server at the telco cloud. So that's it for the use cases. And yeah. I have to admit that we were expecting at this point to have some shouting in the audience saying that, oh, MPTCP, that's awesome, but why it's not in, the, in upstream? Well, it's not in upstream, and it's maybe easy to say that, but it's quite complex. And we will explain why it is so complicated to add multipass TCP in the kernel. So first, I have a perfect audience to say that Linux TCP is highly optimized. So any change can be, com can be complex to introduce. Um, I already talked about the current implementation. It works very well. But um, first, it has been built to support experiment and rapid changes. But it's kind of not generic enough. Uh, by generic enough, we want to say that uh, usually the vendor, or the current vendor, they configure the system to have it working for their use case. Uh, sometimes even the, the vendor, they fully control all the environment, the end-to-end -end environment, so it's kind of easy to use this kernel. It's also important to note that uh, most users, or all users of this kernel, they use it because they want to have MPTCP support. So it's not a big deal if we are affecting TCP connections. Uh, but we... We wanted to create a new group, and that's what we, we did, to upstream multipass TCP, because we want it upstream. But we also want to have the new implementation that doesn't affect the TCP stack. So we don't want to introduce any performance regression, if it's possible. We want to have something easy to maintain, straightforward to configure, and something that can be used in variety of deployment, not without modifying the kernel, for example. Um, one last important point, maybe the most important why it is so complicated, is that MPTCP is a major extension to TCP, and it overlaps so much with it. So we could think that uh, MPTCP, it's, that's the theory, just uh, on top uh, of, t of some TCP flow that we, can, that we also call TCP subflow, and you have just a nice separation of the layers. But we will see later that there are a lot of interaction uh, between the, the layers, the different layers, and of course, it's, the theory is not really what we have in practice. Uh, the problems that we have are mainly linked to the protocol challenges. So we'll just present here just a few examples about uh, the challenges that the protocol gave us. Uh, we have, for example, uh, the TCP sequence number, of course in TCP, you need it to ensure the in-order delivery. We will need something like that for, T for MPTCP for the whole connection. It's easy to understand that with just this schema here. You, uh, you want to send A, B, C, D, E, F, and you can see that you can send data over the, 
the, the two subflow, the two, the two paths. So for that, maybe you will have A, B, C, E, F on one pass, and maybe that's what will come first, and on C will come later. So to solve that, kind of easy, it's like with TCP, you need to add what we call a data sequence number. If you do that, you will know that A, B, C need to be delivered to the application before C. The problem is that, yeah, that's good to have a data sequence number, but we need to put it somewhere, and we will need to put it in the TCP option. That's what the protocol say. Uh, so if we look at the different layer here, uh, the application will send the data. So it will come from the socket layer to the MPTCP layer. That's fine. The MPTCP layer simply select the TCP subflow, okay? But then you are in the TCP stack here, and that's the moment where we, you will need to fill in the TCP header. And that's also the moment where we, you will have to put the TCP option. So what DSS you need to, to put in it? So of course you, will, you are in the TCP stack, but you will need to come back to the MPTCP one. Another challenge that we have with the protocol is the signaling options. So for the signaling option, we can uh, come back to the use scale of the smartphone. You are disconnected from the Wi-Fi, and what you want to do is to signal, to notify the end server that you had a problem with your Wi-Fi interface so it can remove the address. So what happened is here is that you got an inter in a notification, MPCP got a notification. So simple, it will select the subflow, okay. But here what happened is that the MPTCP layer need to send a TCP hack with some particular option. And that's something that is not possible for the moment in a generic way in the Linux kernel. So we, you, we will need to modify the TCP stack to be able to do that. If we look at the other side, when we receive the, this remove address on the server side, for example, we will receive a TCP hack. So it will go to the TCP stack, but first, it's not a duplicate hack. It's a particular TCP hack that for once will not be dropped. It will need to go through the TCP stack and go to the MPTCP stack. So that's also some, a change that we need to do to the TCP stack. Also, what we can see here is that you receive something on one subflow and uh, it affects another TCP subflow. Uh, we saw the problem here with, uh, with the remove address, but there are also other signaling options with multipass TCP. We will need to support that, of course. Yep. Hello. Um, so moving on from there, the um, question is how how do we fit in with the uh, existing code in, in the net subsystem? So um, to start out, there are some parts that actually do fit, um, you know, integrate pretty well. And that's where the uh, implementation is, is layered um, and that, well, excuse me, uh, where MPTCP has aspects that are nicely layered and there are um, parts of the networking subsystem then where the, that aspect of the implementation is layered as well. So um, what we can do is define our own um, prototype, IP proto MPTCP, and that allows us to create our own MPTCP SOC as a top layer that's an inter intermediary for all the interaction between multipath TCP and, and user space. And what that can do is then create our own TCP sockets um, like, like RDS or, um, or KCM and manage those, decide what gets sent to each one and so forth. Um, then since we're using those sockets within the kernel, um, we have a little more rich interfaces going down than, than just the regular socket API. So for example, we can uh, set up the mapping data for multipath TCP packet, um, configure that, and, and then um, use 
uh, TCP send pages to wrap wrap an SKB around um, our outgoing data, um, correlate that with uh, the, the mapping data going out, and continue from there. And then on the um, on the input side, we we can have ac direct access to um, SKBs from the receive queue, which allows us to see the the sequ TCP sequence numbers, which we again need to figure out what order to present things to the, the user layer. And then at the at the lower layer layer with the IP networking core, we have um, per socket callbacks from from IP that let us um, add. It's represented on this diagram as the subflow ops, where we can um, sort of intercept the the calls coming back for. Um, especially for incoming connections, and do do a little extra work before before TCP sees the connections to um, to do what MPTCP needs. So, um, fitting with the the topic of our talk, well, what is what is the challenge here? And um, one of them is uh, indirect call inefficiency. So, you know, as the C programmer is kind of one of the one of the hammers you have to to solve a problem is to um, take a direct function call that that does one specific thing and you know turn it into a pointer and then you can plug in what you need at you know configuration time. So if we're creating a multipath TCP socket, we could just say, oh well, call this instead, and then and then carry on to the regular. Functionality from there, but um, indirect calls are not as efficient as they used to be. Um, with with speculation disabled, um, you know, it, it it was always necessary to justify adding an indirect, you know, replacing some a direct call with an indirect call. But now it's very closely scrutinized, and um, you know, there's effort going into optimizing existing calls or even you know, removing them if possible. Another limitation is that, well, another limitation that comes into play with multipath TCP is that we have this sort of correlated um, data, mapping data between the, um, the packet payload and the TCP options that we want to populate for that specific packet. And the, um, you know, you look at the problem, the thing that seems obvious to do is, okay, well, I just want to attach some extra data to each packet. And with struct skbuf and um, skb shared info that, that is uh, allocated along with the payload, um, those are already, you know, we've got 232, 320 bytes in those um, already, depending on your kernel configuration, and we, you know, we don't want to make those bigger, and, and you know we can't. The maintainers won't, and we we're not asking them to. Um, so we need to find alternate solutions. So, in terms of um, what we've been working on, um, and the, the first thing here is something that we have uh, sent as an RFC patch set to the NetDev list already, and. Um, in, in an approach to MPTCP, we we took our our first strategy was to say, well, there there are places that we need to hook into the TCP stack. There's existing functionality already in the TCP implementation that, that we think has some common requirements, and so what if we you know built some common infrastructure? We could introduce that. We could refactor the existing functionality to Take advantage of it, and so the first thing we did was uh, built uh, an API that let you register a set of um, handlers for specific TCP option numbers that, that would either parse them coming in or allow you to write them going out and just configure that per socket. Um, so we did that. We uh, refactored TCP MD5 and SMC. Um, it, it had the benefits for the TCP core in terms of, you know, we were able to remove 53 if defs for those two f bits of functionality and uh, net 
uh, removed about 750 lines from the TCP core itself, you know, not, not counting the MD5 and SMC code that was moved off to, you know, specific files for those. So, um, we, you know, sent that out as an RFC, and um, the, the two main pieces of feedback we got was, you know, one, it was adding indirect calls, and, and the timing for this was January 2018, so that was a, a hot topic at the time, and still is. And um, the second thing was that when we submitted this, it was, since it only involved MD5 and, and SMC, it did not um, give the, the community reviewers or maintainers perspective into how multipath TCP would use it. And so they, they just didn't have that context when reviewing it. So um, you know, it wasn't merged, but we, we, we got that feedback to build MPTCP first and you know, propose that and build abstractions later when we have, when everybody has the context available. Um, another thing we're doing is um, reducing the amount of kernel code that we need in order to, you know, reach the uh, full feature set eventually. So there's certain functionality for multipath TCP, um, kind of control plane connection, what, what we call path management. Um, where you establish additional um, TCP flows in parallel. And so those are relative, you know, compared to the data plane, those are relatively infrequent and, and not very latency sensitive. So we can reduce our kernel footprint, um, offer more flexibility in terms of um, how systems, you know, manage their policy for those operations. Um, and uh, one more element of what code we've been sharing. So um, we do have our own um, MPTCP upstreaming community mailing list so that we can coordinate amongst each other and, um, you know, share ideas, kind of um, get, get ourselves coordinated before sending proposals to NetDev. And one thing that we've shared in that context is um, addressing the, that problem of the, the socket buffers, SKBs being a certain size um, and not having the space to add the data we wanted. So um, modified SKBuff, well, act more SKB shared info so that we could add additional payload at the end of the, um, the shared info. And this, this was transparent to normal users. Um, it was not, it's not allocated for, you know, regular TCP connection or anywhere else in the system. Um, and it could, you know, pass through the TCP stack and existing code transparently as well. Um, sure, go ahead. Question. So I'm a little um, puzzled why SK buff isn't sufficient. Um, I think the implication here is you have to add a lot of data to it, but it's not clear to me why in multipath TCP this becomes a major issue. Could you give examples of, of the actual data or what, what's lacking from the SK well, buff that MPTCP needs? Sure, sure. Um, well, to, I mean, for example, the existing Linux implementation has, it extends the SK buff control block to contain like the additional sequence numbers at the, the top NT, MPTCP level. But I mean, to, to jump ahead, <laughs> Uh, uh, like CB is there, right? So we have 40 bytes of space in an SK buff. Right. And if you're going from TCP to MPTCP, that's a private interface, so that CB should be available. Are, are you using that? Um, well, the, so the issue is that we need, like, for example, when transmitting, when we're um, supplying the map data, that map data needs to pass all the way through the TCP stack and be available when we're writing the options. And so, you know, TCP itself is making use of the control block. Um, and, and so, you know, we just don't have room to Well, I mean, so, so MPTCP and TCP could be somewhat tightly coupled, where if I send, if I send from MPTCP into TCP, maybe just tell TCP, oh yeah, by the way, the control block has a special meaning when normally it might not, or something like that. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think this is, this is a little risky if we go down the path saying, oh, we have to extend SK buff for this one <laughs> specific protocol. Right. That's, uh, that's a hard uh, premise to start with. Right, exactly. And, and in, in implementing it, we saw that. <laughs> and, and also um, in, in seeing like the, the complexity that was required to allocate and populate the extended control block, 
Hmm. And you know the fact that it's shared between different SK buff clones, which is kind of shown in this diagram where we have two struct SK buffs pointing into the same um, yeah. shared structure. So what we learned yeah. was this is not the way we yeah. want to do it. <laughs> and yeah, we'll, uh, Eric, if you have a quick question, others will let him finish and then okay. line up. Okay. Yeah, um, do you hear me? Yeah, we can, we can hear yes. you. Actually, the, the size of the SK buff is not really critical. If you can afford not clearing a part of it uh, at every SKB allocation. Right now, the SKB CB is cleared when you do the SKB alloc, but you could eventually add another structure, like one, two cache line after the SKB, uh, at the end of the SK buff, without clearing at every SKB allocation, and that would be actually no cost. Like in the because data. adding something at the end of the uh, SKB shared info is a bit uh, difficult because it uh, makes bigger the SKB head, and with the Camaloc uh, power of two allocation strategy, it, it can uh, have some um, huge effect actually. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So I think you know, given those things we've learned, we uh, I think kind of took a step back and figured out we could um, instead of including the data with the SKB itself, we can, uh, in a, in a, TC, in a um, subflow version of a TCP SOC, we could have some alternate queues for, for the mapping data that would allow us to implement that in parallel with the, the receive queue and, and pro, you know, have those. I think it ends up working better for MPTCP to kind of not take this obvious path of just trying to um, pack it in the SK buff. So. Um, so what are we working on right now? So our, our current focus is working towards um, a, a RFC patch set for NetDev. Um, we, we have on our mailing list um, been sharing, kind of developing a, a prototype with um, kind of cleaner layer separation, you know, using these ideas that we're, we're coming up with for a more upstreamable MPTCP. Um, and we're taking, in parallel with that, taking the uh, existing multipath TCP implementation and um, pulling features out of it, you know, ba basically forking the version that um, is in use um, for the, the existing use cases that Matthew mentioned, and, uh, you know, paring that down so that, you know, we have a better picture of what that minimal code set is, and then we can, um, combine those two approaches to, to, to come up with something, you know, leveraging existing code where we can and, and doing something simpler. And um, in addition, starting, starting work on our um, user space uh, MPTCB -D, da daemon that would handle some of the control plane tasks. Um, yeah, just to conclude, we also want to conclude in a, in a positive way. So we think and we hope that you are sure that there is a demand to have MPTCP upstream. So what we want is to build stuff around TCP as much as we can without modifying it. But uh, after this talk, you can understand that we need to make some minimal changes to the TCP stock core or even to, uh, to the network stack with the SKB. But we want to pay attention a lot to the performance impact. So we think that it's a challenge, but we can do it. Uh, if you would like to have more details, there is a wiki, there is a mailing list, a Git repository, so don't hesitate to have a look. Uh, also, feel free to start a discussion now. We can continue them later on the mailing list or wherever you want. Uh, and we hope that the upstream process will lead to a better MPCP implementation. Thank you. If you have any question. Don't worry, Christophe is there. Okay. So um, there was this card, there was this slide about using IP Proto MPTCP, and you said, oh, just like RDS and KCM, right? But that's a problem. The, if I have to change my application to put in IP Proto MPTCP, I can just as well use SATP. I don't need to use MPTCP at that point. 
Right, the whole idea behind MPTCP was this was supposed to be completely transparent. Under the hood, it will just use the multipathing and everything would be cool. And that's not going to be true anymore. The other problem with have requiring me to put IP proto MPTCP in my socket call is how is TLS going to work? This is also a problem we had with RDS, by the way. Right? Uh, it's possible you would have problems with TLS even if you just made it transparent, but now you've made it uh, not possible even. Okay, um, so as far as the, the TLS problem, are you referring to the in-kernel TLS or just TLS in general? TLS in general, user space TLS. So um, TLS in general should not be a problem um, because it runs on top of uh, a reliable byte stream. So, and MPTSP exposes a reliable byte stream to the application. Okay. With respect to your first comment was, um, why are we changing the API? Well, MPTSP's promise was that it's just transparent for the application, right? Um, there are, well, two reasons. First of all, um, MPTSP itself is introducing an overhead compared to regular TCP, just because it's, it's more than TCP, right? It can't be, uh, from a performance perspective, be equivalent to TCP, and so if we by default, opt in everybody to MPTCP, right? They will all be paying a slight cost. A very small one, but they will be paying one. Um, so that's the first reason. And the second reason is because um, to be able to use MPTCP, the user needs to, or the application and or the system administrator need to expose um, or configure policies on how to use MPTCP. Because like, let's say you have Wi-Fi and cell, um, and you are using, you're doing web browsing. So normally you wouldn't want to bring up the cellular interface for or just because you are <coughs> using MPTCP transparently. So there's some more, the, the, the MPTCP stack needs more context to actually make its decisions. And so by changing the API, we make it explicit, yes, this is different and the application needs to provide that context. Right, but there's a difference between setting policy with syscall or IP tables or net filter or something as opposed to asking me to recompile my binary. We have considered using MPTCP simply because we don't have to recompile our binaries, but we can set this policy through some other external means. And this, is, this just changed when you put IP proto MPTCP in there. Now I have to rewrite my application and recompile it, and that's not cool. Right. right. So we, we have a, there are a couple options for that. For, for one, if you have a system where you know you want to make use of multipath TCP. Um, we could say add a sys control that when you said, you know, when you say right. sock so stream. I, type I would zero. recommend not adding this, changing the socket API. Just leave the binary alone, make this yeah. configurable by some other means. Yeah. Um, the other point is you never touched on the coupled congestion control at all. That's pretty intense. Right. And as far as I remember, that's all based on Reno TCP. How will that fit with BBR and all the newer things coming up, the better things coming up? Let me try to answer that question again. Um, so um, the couple con MPTCP does not require the couple congestion control. Um, and the, the couple congestion control is uh, based on Reno and uh, it ha it's not uh, up to date with current uh, congestion control research, right? And it's more like, it, it was a very interesting research project, the couple congestion control. Um, showed some interesting properties on how you can do um, congestion control when using two sub TCP subflows and you are combining the congestion there. But it does not, MPTCP does not require the couple congestion control. You can use BBR with MPTCP and it will just work. There's no problem to that. Yeah, and I think maybe one thing that um, we that didn't get emphasized when we were speaking, um, we do mention in the paper, is the, um, the coupled receive windows between the subflows and that, that being a, a source of complexity. Right, well. but the problem statement behind the coupled congestion control remains, so that has to be solved, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that depends on the use case, right? The, the problem statement on the, about con coupled congestion control is what if in the end your two TCP subflows go over the same bottleneck, right? And then you will get double Exactly, there's a problem of unfairness, and you might, you know, the more subflows you create, the more throughput you get, and so on. Um, I think it's a problem, but 
well, applications already can create just multiple TCP connections if they want to do that. So <laughs> it will make it worse. Maybe yes, maybe no. I, I, I'm not so sure. I think it's the, the, the question of fairness. So, so I think there needs to be a roadmap on how we're going to do that, and especially if you're talking about integration of the kernel. Right? Well, it, it should be fairly easy to add the coupled congestion control mm -hmm. into this model, right? And you say it's based on Reno, there is MP cubic also, so uh, coupled congestion control based on cubic. Um, so there's research coming up that will probably okay. at one point integrate BPR into... Okay, just want to make the point that you, know, you, have to, you need to sure. think about that. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, it's really important, and I can give you the context for this. So if we don't have multipath TCP in Linux and it's being deployed, this is creating the need for an alternative solution. So what we're seeing in high ETF now is the idea of a multipath TCP proxy. So, um, so we know this is being deployed in, in Korean parts of Asia, and what they're doing is, since we can't get server support, um, they claim they can get client support. Since we can't get server support, oh, we'll just put more proxies in the network to do multi-path TCP. And of course, when they did that, they said, oh, this isn't just going to be good for multi-path TCP. Let's make it a generic proxy that can handle any new TCP option. So whenever you introduce a new TCP option now, instead of actually supporting it end-to-end, -end, we could just put something in the middle as an interim solution until we get the full deployment. Well, we know where interim solutions like this go, right? So you can't have an interim solution if you don't have a plan to actually get to the final solution. So multipath TCP is especially interesting because there is quite a bit of history here. It's already been um, kind of proposed in Linux, I think, a few times. Last, last time was actually several years ago. And the feedback was always pretty consistent. This thing is just way too invasive. Um, too many lines of change in TCP, what have you. So my plea is to actually be persistent. Um, if the network maintainer needs a, a fine case of French wine or something like that, by all means, send it to them. Um, but please uh, continue with this, get it in, because the alternatives on the internet are really unpleasant, um, at least in my opinion. Um, for the particulars, I think uh, these are details to be worked out. Um, having a new, a new socket type, I kind of agree with you, so many, but I also, it's like having something there is almost better than nothing, and we could evolve that. So if, if that's a shorter path to actually get something in and then evolve it, that might actually be a reasonable approach. So the, hopefully there's a little bit of flexibility there. Sure, incremental paths are good. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And um, I think it's something I didn't I didn't speak about as in depth as I intended. But but yeah, our, our goal is to have that initial basic implementation so that we do have kind of a foothold to um, develop additional features and see what the community needs. And yeah, so go so from you there. had like a, a statement that you removed X number of lines. It would be good to track uh, number of changes to core networking, like in TCP and then just general lines of code. So we, we probably don't care nearly as much. If you have like multi-path TCP module, then as long as that's well-written, can be whatever lines of code. But going into major surgery on TCP or the socket layer, that's probably where people like Eric are going to start to help give a lot of scrutiny. Right, right. Thank you. Eric? Eric? Yep. <clears throat> What? Anything you want to add? Say? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I'm fully supportive of this uh, MPTCP effort. Um, uh, the recent addition of TLS and KCM in the kernel showed how uh, layer implementation could be done. And I think MPTCP uh, uh, can absolutely do, be done on the same way. So if yeah, so I'm fully supportive of that, and I, I will help you if, if needed. OK. All right, so I think. All right, thank you. Thank you.
It's uh, break time.